So this morning we are going to start uh, a, a brief series here on Jesus, exploring who He is, exploring uh, the work that He's done, uh, and just the incredible uh, person, Savior, and Lord that He is. And uh, it's going to be hopefully a, a, an exciting study, uh, a study to really just kind of remind ourselves again who our Lord and Savior is. And so... Uh, as we get started here this morning, if you want to grab your Bibles and go, we're going to start in Luke chapter 19, uh, towards the end of the chapter in verse 28, uh, and then we'll be going over to Philippians chapter 2, so if you want to kind of put your finger in that as well, uh, to hold that spot, we'll be going there later on. Uh, Just kind of by way of getting started with a few questions here, many of you are going to have some answers already in your minds about these questions, but I'm going to ask these anyway. As we think about, you know, who is Jesus? What did he do and and why did he live? Your minds are probably flooding with lots of answers to those questions right now. But over the next few weeks, as we begin what we refer to as Holy Week or Passion Week on this Sunday, Palm Sunday, uh, we're going to explore these questions. And uh, again, we we have answers, but my hope is that we might learn some new things, that we might be challenged, that we might be ignited or, or, or set on fire for our Savior. Along with this, it's always good to be reminded about who Jesus is, coming back to the core of everything that we as a church are about. It's all about Jesus. So we're going to take some time this week, uh, in the weeks ahead, to really just kind of remind ourselves and focus and dive in, exploring who Jesus is. And it's It's a fascinating exploration. There's times where things are very simple to know, very simple to understand. Just uh, you can read just the love and compassion that Jesus has for people. But yet we can plunge the depths of who he is when we ask questions like, How is it that the person of Jesus Christ, the God man, how does he die on the cross? How does how does God die? Can God die? And these are some of the mysteries and some of the challenges that we have as we study our Lord and Savior. So before we dive into our text here this morning, let's pray and ask the Lord for His help this morning. Father, we give You thanks. We just ask that You be with us as we study, as we take this adventure of exploring again and reminding ourselves and and learning afresh who our Lord and Savior is. So, Father, we ask that you be with us, that we might be challenged in new ways, to live in new ways, the ways in which you have called us to live, and that we might just grow in our relationship and that we might be closer to you. So, Father, we ask that you would bless this time. Teach us from your word this morning, we ask, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as today is Palm Sunday, there's no better place to start uh, than to know the meaning of what we celebrate on today. Uh, Palm Sunday, it gets its name from an event that takes place in Jesus' ministry. Uh, There's palm branches involved, so Palm Sunday. Uh, We also talk about this being uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus, and uh, we're going to see some of the reasons why it's called that as well. So if you're with me in Luke chapter 19... Uh, This is the event. This is Palm Sunday, as it were. After Jesus had said this, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever Why are you untying the colt? They replied, 
The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joy joyously, joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. I had three bars when I tested it this morning, and it just instantly died. All right, let's get back to that word that was challenging for me to read. Began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And may the Lord bless the hearing and reading of his word this morning. Well, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, we wonder why Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. It seems strange in a lot of ways because Jesus has been to the city before lots of times. Never came in on a donkey. What makes this special? What is the significance of him coming in on a donkey? And this is one of those moments where all four Gospels, they record this moment. They record this moment. This seems to be an important moment in Jesus' life and in Jesus' story. And so the question that we wrestle with is why? Why is this important? Well, if you read Matthew's Gospel, uh, we get a, a, a sense that it's about fulfilling prophecy. As he writes, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place. Matthew writes, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, and that prophet being uh, Zeph uh, Zechariah, uh, chapter 9, verse 9. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So again, looking at Matthew's gospel, you kind of get the sense, well, Jesus did this in order to fulfill prophecy. Uh, a prophet of the Old Testament said that this was going to happen. And that's part of it. That's part of the answer why he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. It is to fulfill prophecy. But there's more to it than that. And if you dig into history a little bit, especially the history of uh, the coronation day of the kings of Judah after David, you'll come to learn that the coronation begins with the new king on a colt, that is a donkey that has never carried a burden before, outside the city. And the king would be brought into the city on this colt. There would be, you know, fanfare and, and, and you know, a parade and, you know, all the things that go along with that. And the new king would be carried into the city peacefully on this colt. And that was the beginning of his coronation. To where at the end of the procession, after all the pomp and circumstance and, and getting up to that throne, he would eventually be crowned king. So Jesus here entering the city of Jerusalem is symbolic that a new king is coming to be crowned. And we miss this sometimes. Again, when we read the, the, the story of Matthew or, or Matthew's gospel, we, we, we get the idea, again, that this is just something that Jesus does to fulfill prophecy. But it's way more than that. It's symbolic. It's emphasizing that a new king is coming. And the crowd, according to all the gospels, seems to have that somewhat of an understanding that Jesus is this king coming to them. 
Again, in Matthew, it talks about the, 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 the crowd yells out, you know, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, uh, they, they shout out him and recognize Jesus as the son of David. Again, that's, that's recognizing his kingship, his royalty. And even here, Luke blatantly says of the crowd saying, what? Blessed is who? The king who comes in the name of the Lord. So the crowd seems to have this recognition of, of the king. So this is just an incredible moment, an incredible symbolism where Jesus is coming into the city. Now, now you know, we don't get any information of, of, you know, observers. We understand here in Luke's gospel that the Pharisees seem to be kind of put out by this. They can't believe that, that you know, the, the city is celebrating this, this rabbi coming into the city on a colt, and they probably understand the symbolism. And they try to tell Jesus, hey, will you tell your disciples to be quiet? Stop them. I, I love Luke's gospel because this is the only place where you kind of get this information. Jesus' response is, if I tell them to be quiet, there's still going to be celebration. There's still going to be praise. There's still going to be shouting. But it won't be coming from them. Where will it be coming from? The rocks. The earth itself will cheer on this new king who is entering God's city. So, Pharisees again just upset with Jesus and can't believe because they likely know what this symbolizes. This is how kings of old would enter the city. And they don't see Jesus as their king. They don't see Jesus as the one whom God promised to sit on David's throne forever. But the crowd welcomes this. The crowd is celebrating this moment. The crowd is ecstatic that, that, they, that they see their, their king coming because they believe it to be Jesus, because of all the incredible miracles that he's accomplished, that they've witnessed and seen. They're just... They're, they're celebrating. They're like, finally, God has brought the Messiah, the King. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. There's an incomplete picture that not only the crowd has, but we often have. The crowd here has assumptions about who the Messiah is. When you kind of go look at what the Jews taught at the time of Jesus, what the Messiah would be like, what he would do, what he would accomplish, and, and things. And even the, when you go and search Scripture, when you look in the Gospels and you pay attention to what the disciples are saying to Jesus, Jesus, uh, as we saw in Mark a while back when we studied through Mark, Jesus three times tells the disciples, I need to go to Jerusalem and die. And each time Jesus is rebuked by the disciples, they just don't understand. What do you mean? No, no, no. You're the Messiah. You're going to go in. You're going to take that throne. And you're going to kick Rome out. And when you do that, God is going to bring that age that we've been waiting for. That age of peace. Shalom. That age where, where God will finally judge the nations, especially Rome, for how they've treated us. God will judge them. There will be justice and we will celebrate. That's, that's what the crowd is thinking. That's who the Messiah is to them. And they think Jesus is that Messiah. He's going to come in. He's going to sit on, on David's throne and he's going to raise the army and we're going to beat up the Romans and they're going to get kicked out and then God's going to judge them and destroy them and it's going to be, oh, just so awesome. That the promises that God has made in the Old Testament are finally going to come true. That's in the crowd's mind as they celebrate. This new age from God is going to come and be complete. And, and we'll finally get to live with God in peace as His people because He loves us. He doesn't love everyone else. He's going to destroy and judge them because of how they've treated us and hated us. It's just going to be us and God. That's what they want. That's what they're waiting for. That's what they're hoping and waiting to see Jesus do. 
Well, of course, we know the rest of the story. The crowd doesn't exactly know what's going to unfold in the days ahead, but we know that Jesus is arrested. Jesus is beaten. Jesus is crucified. On that Friday, the celebration that took place on this Sunday as he entered Jerusalem, a lot of people probably hung their heads going, we thought, we thought this was the guy. We thought that this was God's Messiah. What just happened? He's dead now. And we see that even in the disciples as they, as they take refuge, they fear. They run away and hide. So that's the crowd's problem. Our problem, what makes this picture somewhat incomplete for us is, yes, we see this is a a triumphal entry because we know what's going to happen at the end of the week. Because we've learned this story. Jesus is arrested. He's beaten. He's crucified. And He's resurrected. Having victory over sin, death, and Satan. Paying the price for our sin on the cross. And so, yes, this is the moment where where Jesus comes in triumphant. You know, He's going to win the day. To where all that is true, there is yet a peace that we often miss. This is Jesus' beginning of His coronation. Jesus' coronation ultimately is the cross. Jesus' throne is the cross. And we often don't think of His throne as the cross. We don't think that the things that Jesus goes through in this week is His coronation. It is Him being crowned the King. To be honest with you, in a lot of ways, we we look at the crucifixion a little bit selfishly. We look at it and it goes, well, look, that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And that's true. I don't want to, you know, minimize that by any means. But we often miss other elements. We miss the idea that this is where Jesus becomes the King. That he's always been. This is his coronation. And I think Paul is someone who helps us see this idea a little bit. So go over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. So verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who because He is God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. Rather, He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think what Paul ultimately shows us here, the insight that Paul has that he's sharing with the Philippian community is that it's through Jesus' humiliation, it's through His sacrifice, it's through His suffering that Jesus receives the crown and receives the name that is above every name. You know what name that is? It's God's name. Yahweh, if that's how you actually pronounce it. 
That's the name in which God the Father bestows upon God the Son. And again, you know, when we're talking about God and the Trinity, Jesus always having the being God and 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 you know, wait a minute, how does God crown himself king when he's already king? You know, those are yeah, those are head scratchers. But the point that we need to see is that it that Jesus' coronation, his 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 whole the pomp and circumstance for Jesus in becoming king is humiliation. Suffering, pain, and ultimately death. And because Jesus did that, because Jesus lowered himself, because he, being God, did not take advantage of his godness, and he took on the very nature of a servant, being in human likeness. And he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, which in Jewish culture is someone who is cursed. He's cursed by God. Because Jesus did this, Paul writes, therefore God exalted Him to the highest place. God bestowed on Jesus His very name. And He was crowned King. Verse 11, and every tongue acknowledged what? That Jesus Christ is Lord. That is a title for God. King, Lord, they're kind of interchangeable in a lot of ways. There might be some distinction in some contexts. But for the most part, it is the idea of sovereign king. The one who is in authority. And so as we kind of reflect on the events of today that took place a few thousand years ago, we see that Jesus' coronation was very different than any king of the earth. With any earthly king, there is a lot of pomp and circumstance. Some of you might remember this. Some of you might remember back in 1952 when Queen Elizabeth II was pronounced queen after her father, King George the Seventh or Sixth, passed away. At the time of her coronation, a year later, there was much pomp, splendor, and pageantry surrounding her installation as queen. Since a king or queen doesn't rule America, we really can't relate to at all what the pageantry and splendor that England goes through when they get to have a new king or queen installed. Usually when a sovereign is crowned, he or she wears the most expensive robes and jewels and would be driven to the capital city in an ornate carriage drawn by beautiful horses. Accompanying the king or queen would be uh, courtiers and foreign dignitaries and following would be a large entourage of finely dressed soldiers all decked out in their medals and their shiny swords and things. There would also be high-ranking religious leaders officiating over the whole affair. Musicians would play. Praises would be sung and prayers made all coming to a peak when the new sovereign is actually crowned as king or queen. A little bit more history here. At the coronation of Queen Victoria in 1838, she wore a crown adorned with giant rubies and sapphire surrounding a 309-carat diamond. Her scepter was capped with an even larger diamond, the Star of Africa, the largest cut diamond in the world. It weighed 530.2 carats, which equals about a half a pound worth of diamond. That's a coronation that the world gives its sovereign. The coronation in which the Father gave His Son was humiliation, suffering, death. What a stark contrast. Oftentimes we see God operate completely different than the world. Jesus' coronation was nothing like Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria's. 
His was marked again with suffering and death. And the throne was not a cushy seat of gold and beauty. It was a piece of wood. A cross. An instrument used by Rome to torture people who were political enemies. That's Christ's throne. And so when we challenge kind of the so what, well, okay, this is what Jesus went through. We thank Jesus that He would do such a thing for us in order to rescue us. But again, there's a bigger picture here. There's more to it. To be given the title Lord means to be sovereign ruler. Again, that is to be king. As Jesus is our king, our allegiance and loyalties are to Him. And our loyalties cannot be split. As Jesus says in Matthew 10, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Our loyalties, our allegiance, has to be, must be, given completely to Christ. Now again, Jesus is not saying you shouldn't love your mom and dad, you shouldn't love your your siblings, you shouldn't love your children. But if they are someone who causes you to remove your allegiance from Christ, that shouldn't happen. An example of this, if you've seen the movie, the first movie in the God's Not Dead series, there's a very powerful scene of a daughter of a Muslim family where at some point in her life she becomes a Christian and she comes home after school and she's in her bedroom with her door open and she's on the bed and on her iPod is you know a Christian band of some sort. She's, or uh, I believe she's actually listening to a passage of Scripture being read and her little brother walks in and sees what's on the iPad or iPod. The next scene, you see dad rushing in, looking at it, ripping it from her, lifting her up, carrying her to the door of the house, opening it and putting her on the doorstep and closing the door. A moment like that is going to test someone's allegiance. A moment like that is going to say, is it really worth following Christ? If I'm going to lose my family? Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me, Jesus says. And so in those hard moments, we have to hang on and be committed to Christ no matter what happens. The same goes in our relationship with our country. Yes, we love our country, but our allegiance isn't to our country, it's to Christ. And if our country says, follow Christ or follow us, which way is our allegiance going to go? As we studied Revelation, we saw that one day in the future, is it near, is it far? That's hard to say. But there will come a time where one needs to give their allegiance to the governing authorities in order to buy food. There's going to come a time where one has to give their allegiance and be marked by the governing authorities in order to even survive. Will we hang on to our allegiance? Secondly here, as Jesus is our King, He is our example to follow. And this ties directly into the idea of of our allegiance belonging to Him and Him alone. As we go back to Philippians chapter 2, we look at verse 5 and what do we see? As Paul's writing, the actual context here of, of what Paul is saying is that in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That we would be people 
who would put away any type of advantage that we have as people in order that we might be people who would suffer humiliation. That we would be humbled to be servants like Christ, even until the point of death. Again, as Jesus says, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's the challenge of following in the footsteps of Christ. That's the challenge of Him being our Lord and fully committed to Him. That we would be people who would suffer humiliation. That we would be people who would walk a path of suffering as Christ did. If our King walks such a path, shouldn't we? And then ultimately, and everlastingly, how we respond to Jesus as King has eternal consequences. Any skeptical indifference won't save. Any irritated disbelief won't save. Only those who believe in Him as their, as their only sovereign Lord will be saved. And that's the call. That's the call, that there's more than just the here and now at stake. There's an eternity at stake. Jesus becomes king. Jesus receives glory from the Father by being humiliated. What a challenge for us. That we would go after the humiliating thing rather than the pomp and circumstance of the world. So to add to the video, that's our King. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You for this incredible challenge to see what it really means for you to be king, what you had to go through to receive your crown. And Father, as your disciples, as your children, help us to be bold, to walk worthy, to suffer humiliation for your glory. Father, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know that we truly wrestle with the things of this world, our reputations. We desire the pomp and circumstance, we desire the praise, we desire to be part of something so glorious. And when we look at the path you walk, the cross that you bear, the throne that you sit on, we wrestle with going after it. So, Father, help us, humble us, that we might be more like you. Lord Christ, you are our King. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. It is in your name we pray.